in the earlier module, we gave our motivation and also the background about finite volume method. We also gave you a little bit on the theoretical side, how it really connects to the Maxwell system. In this module, we are going to look into the discretization itself. So let us go into it. So we are talking about spatial discretization. We will come back to the temporal discretization in our later lessons. So what we have is let us say a domain which is represented by let us say a square. I mean it need not be a square, it could be any random shape, but just to prove certain ideas I have taken a simple square surface. So you can basically discretize this using the standard squares what you have in finite difference method and also you have to have a dual mesh in the case of the finite difference method but in the case of finite element you can basically have a structured mesh. So what you have here is a mesh which is structured I call it structured because there is certain patterns in which these elements are individually placed. It need not be like this because the one of the beauty of the conformal method is to go for unstructured mesh. So it can have certain random things, it can really have small triangles, big triangles, what not. So this is the kind of discretization we are going to talk about, particularly unstructured mesh. So let us say we take a standard three dimensional case where you have tetrahedral mesh and the values that we are talking about E and H field are basically stored in the center point which is the Barry center point. As compared to finite element method in the nodal method, finite element nodal discretization where you will have values stored in the nodal points. And of course you can also for talk about edge elements where you have the elements, edges will have the value stored but here in the case let us say we are talking comparing it to finite element where the values are stored in the nodal. So as compared to the finite element we will have only one particular point where the E and H field is stored. But then the question is what are these yellow points? The yellow points are the phase center points. These are the center of these phases. If you are talking about a three dimensional case these are the Barry center of these triangles which are forming the four phases. Why is it more important is because we are going to compute the fluxes. Remember that in the case of the finite volume we talked about a case where we are going to have a volume and we are talking about flux that are going in and out on each of the phases. So we are assigning one particular point which is let us say the center. So this is in the case of a tetrahedron will be the the center of the face of each of the sides. So that is the point what we are talking about as face centers. So that being said we can get to know that there are four sides call them phases and these phases have individual components each nodes and each of them will have centers. So let us say we are interested in the 2D problem how do we translate this from a tetrahedron we can go to a triangle and the triangle will have also a Barry center which will be the center of the face of this particular triangle and the center of each of the sides are nothing but the center of each of the edges. So this in the case of a two dimensional problem can be seen along with the neighbors. For example, this particular triangle has three neighbors. If it is a boundary triangle, one of the edge will not have a, a neighbor whereas the other two sides will have neighbors. So assume that you are talking about a case where this particular side is the boundary side. What you will have is only these two triangles and this triangle will be non-existent. So if it is a main bulk triangle it will have three neighbors and one more thing is the number of triangles 
that are attached to a particular node is quite dependent on the mesh itself. Sometimes it could be just 3, it could be 4. So, depending on the mesh refinement, the number of triangles attached to a node will change. And as you can see, we are talking about the projection from the center of the barycenter of the triangle to the face center. Similarly, we are talking about projections on each of those sides. These are nothing but the projections. So, in other words, in a two dimensional case, these are the normal projection what we are interested in. So, let us say we can extrapolate that normal projection a little bit further. In the three dimensional case, what we will have is the normal vectors pointing on all of those sides. And this is very important to know because this normal vectors will be used in the flux computation as we will see in the next slide. So, we will go now into the Maxwellian system itself. So, like in the case of the example problem which we solved in the earlier module, we see that the wave magnetic field is varying along one plane and we have the E field varying along one plane and we can write this form in a more generalized form. This is a 3D component. The bold letters represent their vectors and we are considering only scalar quantities for epsilon and mu. So, this can be written in a semi discrete form as follows. As you can see, the flux components what we talk here are the flux components that we used from the earlier slide. And these flux components are computed along each of the side, whether we are in a one dimensional case or two dimensional case or three dimensional case, the flux components will be changed accordingly, but still they are defined on the edges or on the faces of each of the control volumes. And S of k, as I mentioned before, it is nothing but the surface area of the kth phase. And there are k phases for a particular control volume Vi. So, k goes from 1 to f, we will define that in the next slide. So, what we are having now is a combined vector in the case of a three dimensional problem, six component vector, and they correspond to the magnetic field and electric field. As you can see, the i represent the i the cell and each of these components are the magnetic field components along those sides. And uh, the T represents the transpose of the field component, because uh, for mathematically to model them, we need to have the matrix form properly represented. So, we have here phi of q of k, that is the flux component on the k's phase which is the function of q, which is represented as the dot product between the flux function and the normal component. As you can see here, we are having the particular case where we have n cross e and n cross h. So, if we compare that with our earlier slide, where we had the formulation for fluxes, we will see these are the components that we have in this slide, so which is seen here. So, basically these are the n cross e term or n cross h term. So, if we say that we are having only, so n cross e in the case where we had only E y component will be given as the x component, the y component and z component and we have n x, n y and 0, because we do not have a normal component on the z axis and we have 0, E y and we have 0 again. So, for the test case where we had E is equal to 0 E y 
0 and b is equal to 0 0 b z we will see the n cross e will be given as the x component multiplied by 0 times 0 will be 0 minus the y component multiplied by 0 plus the z component multiplied by n x e y minus 0. Similarly, the n k cross h or b whatever you wanted to compute will have components that are given by x component, y component and z component n x, n y 0, 0, 0 b z which is nothing but x component multiplied by n y b z multiplied by 0. Similarly, minus y n x b z plus the z component times 0. So, we will have components along the x coordinate and y coordinate. So, what we will get is the flux function accordingly represented in this particular slide. So, this is the definition for defining the value of n k and e k n k h k. Uh, we are using here e and h instead of e and b because we are going to compute e and h directly. We are not going to use b factor, but in the example I showed you b because I wanted to use the definition of a which is the, the matrix, the diagonalizable matrix. So, that being said this is the form that will be very useful for coding the Maxwell equation. So, in this particular form we have to also define the material parameters and the material parameters are defined in the diagonal matrix given by this matrix here. So, the semi discrete form will have alpha which are defined here and the volume which is the volume of ith cell and the flux component which comes directly from the previous slide here as you can see and we are using it to compute the semi discrete form. This form is the most useful form for us to go forward because it basically tells whatever we need to know about the finite volume method what is left for us to do is the temporal discretization which we will do in the following lectures. With that I wanted to also give you a simplified form for a 2D case where you have T m or T e case where you have H x, H y and E z. The magnetic field are only in the x y plane, no magnetic field component in the z axis. And similarly, the electric field components are only in the x y plane, no electric field component in the z axis will be the T e case. So, if we have this form, we can compute the fluxes accordingly. So, q 3, q 2 are nothing but these components. In the case of the T m case, minus q 3 means minus E z and minus q 2 means minus H y and q 3 is E z and q 1 is H x and this will give us the definition of various things. So, in the case of a T m case we have definition as follows. So, in most of the examples in our next slides what we will do is we will be focusing on a T m case to showcase some of the practical applications of modeling finite volume systems where we will use either a plane wave traveling in x axis or a waveguide solution and we will also look into some of the advanced techniques 
namely the perfectly matched layers or absorbers layers how do you define them what are the constraints so on and so forth with this we come to the end of this particular module thank you. <laughs>